We all know the tale of Romeo and Juliet, star-crossed lovers who, through a series of tragic events, end up taking their own lives rather than live without one another. But that happens right at the end of the play. Surely at the beginning, when they first meet, these archetypal, youthful lovers give us nothing but sighs and swooning, passionate romance and unbridled delight. Mm, not quite. What dark clues are waiting to be unearthed in the early pages of Romeo and Juliet? And how does Shakespeare stage the very first meeting of our leading lovers in a way that portents the tragedy that will befall them? Romeo and Juliet first meet at the Capulet family's masked ball, an event Romeo's not really welcome to attend. Tybalt, Juliet's cousin, who Romeo later kills in a sword fight, spoilers, recognises Romeo's voice from behind his mask and wants to shiv him there and then, but is dissuaded by Daddy Capulet. In case you need a refresher, the Capulets, of whom Juliet is one, and the Montagues, the family to which Romeo belongs, are rivals, hence the difficulties that persist throughout the play in terms of their being together. Anyway, so Tybalt's mad, but he leaves to cool off, meaning Romeo is free to meet Juliet. They share a brief but intensely beautiful and brilliant dialogue. Brilliant, because in only 14 lines, Shakespeare does lots and lots of clever things. And I've already given you a clue about one of these clever things. What kind of poem is traditionally made up of 14 lines? Comment below if you think you know. These lines are incredibly romantic. They lead to a first kiss, after which Romeo and Juliet fall madly and immediately in love. And fun fact, up until this point, Romeo was madly and immediately in love with another girl, Rosaline, whom he promptly forgets. The lines that make up Romeo and Juliet's first meeting are powerful. They constitute what Lawrence Perrine calls a self-contained episode, having a plot of their own, forming a mini play within a play. However, Dreamy and impactful as these lines are, the romantic tenor of this first meeting shrouds a dark undercurrent of foreboding, lurking just beneath the surface. But before we get into all that, let's have a look at the lines themselves. Suspend our disbelief for a few minutes and pretend everything's right and romantic instead of dark and tragic. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle vine is this. My lips. Tomb, blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch of the tender kiss. Good pilgrim, you'd wrong your hand too much. Which man you did wish to show us? Saints have hands, pilgrims' hands do touch, and palm to palm is only palm's kiss. Have not saints lips? close attention. You might be thinking, hang on, that was more than 14 lines. You said that Shakespeare does a lot of clever stuff in 14 lines. And we'll get to that in a moment. You'll notice a few things right off the bat. These lines are riddled with wordplay, and they're driven forward by an extended metaphor that immediately conflates the love that Romeo and Juliet share with religion. Romeo begins with what is effectively a slick pickup line. He deifies Juliet, placing her on a pedestal high above him, turning her into a saint. If by touching her hand he has offended her, holy shrine that she is with his rough, non-saint-like hands, he must kiss her by way of apology to take away his sin. Smooth, right? There's something very elegant and romantic about gentle sin. This is a sin of a softer, more forgivable nature than regular old non-gentle sin. Romeo is eloquent, mischievous, and flirtatious from the off. 
I also want to draw attention to the way he describes his own lips, two blushing pilgrims, which not only draws Juliet's attention to the prospect of a saintly kiss, but further sexualizes their encounter. The word blushing indicates coyness, innocence perhaps. To blush is demure, endearing, a, a physical sign of attraction, right? But to blush is also a sign of embarrassment. It's involuntary. It's showing our inner, private emotions on our faces. It immediately suggests vulnerability. And more than this, it's only a hop and a skip away from being flushed. The pinkening of a cheek turned into the red flush of an intense romantic encounter in a post-coital state, even. Romeo's bid for a kiss invites embarrassment from Juliet, touches on the sexual chemistry they will share, and nods towards the climax to which this kiss will lead. And the juxtaposition between a pilgrim, a person making a serious holy pilgrimage, and blushing conflates religion with sexual desire, telling we, the audience, that this is a forbidden encounter, even before Romeo and Juliet know one another's identities. Then we get Juliet's response, and to my mind, she gives as good as she gets. Romeo opens with what you could read as a bit of a challenge. And I don't know about you, but when I was 13, yes, Juliet is 13 in the play, if someone said something tricksy and flirtatious to me from behind a mask at my parents' party, I'd probably run away or melt into the floorboards. But not so Juliet. She flirts back and amplifies the metaphor and the wordplay. She allays Romeo's concerns, telling him that he hasn't touched her hand in a sinful way, but with mannerly devotion. And besides, she says, pilgrims touch the hands of saint statues at places of worship, so, you know, it's all good. And then she returns the flirt by likening the touching of palms to a devotional kiss. Juliet runs with the metaphor set up by Romeo that she is the saint and he the pilgrim. She is in the position to forgive his sins and to accept his devotion. She reinforces the fact that theirs is already a connection predicated on sensuality and touch by her repeating of hands and palms, and she plays on the word palm to mean both hand and holy palmer, palmer being a word used interchangeably with pilgrim. So this connection between touch, intimate and sexualized, and devotional religion is reinforced. Juliet playfully and astutely interlinks the touch of a lover to the touch of a saint, blessing a pilgrim. Then we get more playful back and forth, as Romeo asks whether saints and pilgrims have lips too, to which Juliet answers, of course they do, all the better to pray with, my dear, banter which culminates in Juliet inviting Romeo to kiss her while she remains in place, like a statue of a saint, granting his prayers. So you could read this as a perfect, dreamy first meeting. Immediate chemistry, playful dialogue, consensual kissing, and there's even more romance to be unpacked. What is that poetic form that's traditionally made up of 14 lines? It's a sonnet, the form so readily used to express feelings of love. The first 14 lines here make up a sonnet. They almost follow the classic Shakespearean rhyme scheme, they're made up of three quatrains and a rhyming couplet at the end, and we can't ignore that musical, iambic pentameter running throughout. And remember to like and subscribe for regular poetical content. That Romeo and Juliet share a sonnet is special, and we don't find anything else like it in the play. As Scott F. Crider tells us, the play is full of poets, granted. Almost all the characters speak in blank verse, many of the characters in the play fashion couplets, but only Romeo and Juliet compose a sonnet together. What's more, if you look at the next few lines, up to Juliet's You Kiss by the Book, they make up a quatrain of their own, suggesting Romeo and Juliet aren't just composing one sonnet together, but a sonnet sequence, until they're interrupted by dialogue from Juliet's nurse. And I simply have to draw attention to this final line. Not only have they just shared a sonnet, and are working on a second, but here Romeo and Juliet share a line that's broken in the middle by a kiss. I mean, how much more intertwined can these lovers get with their language? This is one of the reasons this exchange is so brilliant. To really hammer home the point that Romeo and Juliet are destined to be together, Shakespeare has them compose and share a sonnet. Surely the ultimate way to memorialize their love. Their first meeting is a love poem, that culminates in their first kiss. Literally what could be more romantic? But another reason these lines are so brilliant is that their romantic overtones conceal the tragedy and foreboding that we all know comes to dominate the play. Firstly, it's a good idea to note that this extended religious metaphor is kind of a hop, skip and a jump away from blasphemy, which today we might not think too much of, but back in the 1590s could land you in some deep shit. Romeo and Juliet was written at a time in which religious divide between Catholics and Protestants was a constant source of tension in England, 
So having two characters fall in love through idolatrous language that commingles Christianity and foreplay might have suggested to an Elizabethan audience that Romeo and Juliet are asking for trouble. More specifically, their shared references to saints, shrines, idolatry, etc. nods towards the Catholic faith. England at this time was officially a Protestant country, and Catholics were required by law to abandon their religious practices, sometimes they were forced into hiding, and in some cases they were executed for their beliefs. And if you want to learn more about the details of Catholic persecution, heresy, and religious divide in Shakespeare's time, please check out our video. More than this, the repeated allusions to touch in particular, hands, palms, etc., smacks of Catholic worship. As Farrah Karen Cooper tells us, the efficacy of touch was at the core of pre-Reformation religious worship. Shakespeare invokes the ritualistic practices of the medieval cult of saints. The hands of the saints that were routinely kissed, decorated and worshipped in the shrines of Europe. The votive tradition required at times body parts, particularly hands, fashioned out of wax, alabaster or gold, to be delivered to shrines and left as offerings. No longer practiced in England by the time Shakespeare was writing plays, votive offerings were reimagined into secular and theatrical contexts, and playhouses abounded with the imagery and props that gestured back to some of the religious practices that had been outlawed. So not only might you argue Romeo and Juliet are blaspheming, but they're actively indulging in idolatrous language and actions of physical touch that an audience of the late 1500s would know to associate with Catholicism. So while on the one hand the extended Christian metaphor aligns their love with something holy and divine, above the din of mere mortals, it also implicates them in heretical and potentially treasonous behaviour. And if we want another example of how Romeo and Juliet's first exchange portents their doom, we need look no further than that most romantic of poetic forms, the sonnet. Yes, I would argue that it's definitely the case that by writing their first meeting as a sonnet within the text of the play, Shakespeare is drawing attention to the intensity of their shared passion, love and ardour. Sharing the lines binds them together in what almost feels like a solemn prayer or a marriage vow. But it also makes us, as audience members, think back to the last time we encountered a sonnet in the play, drawing our attention right back to the prologue, to a sonnet of a much different disposition. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love, and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end naught could remove, is now the two hours' traffic of our stage. To which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. A sonnet with a very different vibe, I'm sure you'll agree. In these opening lines, we're told explicitly that Romeo and Juliet are fated to take their own lives as a result of the ongoing mutiny between their families. So when we then get to the end of Act 1 and we're treated to the beautiful, romantic first kiss sonnet, we quickly think, hmm, wasn't there another sonnet in the not-so-distant past? Oh, right, the one about them both dying at the end of the play. Knowing what we know from the prologue sonnet casts the first kiss sonnet as darkly foreboding. It is this, their meeting, that will lead to their untimely deaths. And some of the imagery from the prologue sonnet echoes that of the first kiss sonnet, further solidifying this connection between new love and tragic fate where civil blood makes civil hands unclean, a line that essentially foregrounds the fact that blood will be spilled and that both lead characters will end the play with blood on their hands, is mirrored in Romeo and Juliet's intimate and repeated references to hands and palms as sources of sensual touch, holy reverie and pleasure. And you could even argue that the stunted sonnet sequence functions as a bad omen too. Romeo and Juliet share one beautiful sonnet and begin another before being prematurely cut off. Just as their sonnet sequence is ended before it begins, so are their lives together. Both these sonnets, then, work to seal the tragic fates of our leading lovers. As much as romance and love seem, from an initial reading, to take precedence at their first meeting, Romeo and Juliet are forever dogged by their impending doom, written as it is in the stars. For never was a story of more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. But were sonnets always declarations of love and despair? How did they originate, and what happened to the form after Shakespeare's heyday? Learn more about the sonnet by clicking here next.